فاشرف بي لاشتغال بالعلم ولا تبغي به ما عشت يا ذا بدلا ويا له من شرف عظيم ان شاء الله تعالى we're now going to be speaking about um asila al jadaliya as i said to you before this ilm which is called ilm al jadal is based on a person who is establishing a proof who is claiming something and another person whose job is to uh, oppose this individual and prove that their claim is invalid so the scholars they say that there's a job for the sail and the sail is the one who is who's basically is opposing the one who's claiming and the one who's claiming he's called a muallil so what we'll do inshallah ta'ala is we're going to speak about the pillars that the su'al stands on so the pillar it stands on the su'al al jadaliyu it stands on four pillars okay the first is as-sa'ilu a questioner one that's asking questions and the second one is al-mas'ul the one that's been questioned and the fourth is al-mas'ul anhu the third is al-mas'ul anhu and that's the evidence and the ruling that's been asked about and the fourth pillar is المسؤول به وهو لفظ السؤال the fourth one is the wordings that are used when questioning how you phrase your question those are the pillars it stands on okay those are the four pillars but the types in which the ulama the jadaliyin they divide the questions into it, it can be taken to five meaning when the discussion is going on these are the pillars it stands on there's one who's been questioned there's the questioner he's questioning him about the evidence and the and the ruling and the way he's putting his question forward are you with me brothers that's the pillars of this how this dialogue is going on so, but the scholars they take it back to five five types or five examples from a five asila five questions that he's allowed to ask basically these are the five questions that he puts forward the first question is anil madhab he asks him about his madhab what does it mean madhab madhab here means ma taqulu fi kada what do you say about this when he says to him ma taqulu fi kada what do you say about this particular issue or when he asks him ma hukmu hadhihi al-mas'ala 'indak what's the hukum of this issue to you that's the first one this is madhab he wants to know your madhab in this issue what do you believe the scholars they divide this into two this one the first one they divide it into two in how he asks him about the madhab they divide it into two the first way that he can ask him about his madhab is what he says to him is he you go to the individual and you say to them do you have a do you hold an opinion in this particular issue are you with me brothers do you hold an opinion a madhab in this particular issue like for example he will say to him ikhtalaf al fuqaha the scholars differed fi hukm zakat al huli the zakat that the woman the, 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 the gold that the woman wears and she adorns herself with the scholars they differed whether zakat is obligatory on it 
There's a khilaf. Some people, the scholars, they say it's like her clothes. You don't pay the cash from your clothes, right? And some scholars, they say, no, it's gold and it's money. Zakat has to be paid from it. Are you with me, brothers? Zakatul huli, the zakat of the gold, of the woman which she wears, is obligatory if I to pay zakat from it. Scholars differ. So you say to this individual that the scholars differed in zakatul huli. Do you hold an opinion regarding this issue? Or, ma madhabuka fiha? What's your madhab regarding this? That's the first question. The second one, which is in the first swell, is you can say to him, and you can say to him, you're a hanbali, right? And he says to you, yeah, I'm hanbali. That's my madhab. And you say to him, Al-Imam Ahmed has riwayataini fi hukm zakat al-huli. So before, you were just wanting to know whether he holds an opinion in this issue. He could say, no, I don't hold an opinion. He could say that to you. But now I've restricted in the second point. He said, are you hanbali? He says, yeah, I'm hanbali. Now he can only choose from within these two. Because he's restricted because I brought him in by saying that he's a hanbali. Is muqaddimah to dalil. I've brought him in to the madhab of Imam Muhammad. He's accepted that muqaddimah, that introduction I put forward. He says, Naam, I accept that I'm al-Hambali. You say, Imam Muhammad has two riwayah in this particular issue. Zakatul huli. Are you with me? So which of the two do you take? And which of the two do you have? Are you with me? Here, at this particular moment, he can't say, I don't have a madhab in this particular issue. Are you with me? He'll say to you, I take this in the Qawr. Then the niqash opens. Then the discussion opens. Are you with me, brothers? That's the first question. And those are the two ways that it can be asked. If you're good at al-jadal wal munadara which one do you take from asking the madhab? You take the second one. It's a sharper way of doing it. You muqaddimah to dalil and you brought him in, and now he's forced and he's obliged to a respond to one of the two. Are you there? Because it's not going to look good for him to say, I don't have a madhab now. Because he did accept that he's got a madhab, right? He said, I'm Imam Ahmed, I'm upon his madhab. The second question is, Ali dalil the first question was what? The first question was عن uh, madhab, right? Now you found that he's madhab. Now he told you that he believes, for example, the zakat al-huli is wajib, or he says not wajib. He's taking a stance right now. So you say to him, what's the dalil? Second question is عن dalil what's your evidence? The dalil here means ma daliluka ala tarjih al qawli al fulaniyyi. What's your evidence in strengthening? Are you with me? What's your evidence in strengthening this opinion of his? Why did you strengthen the second opinion of Imam Ahmad, the other riwayah of Imam Ahmad over the other riwayah? Why did you strengthen one over the other? Because you've just done tarjih now. And as they say, Dictatorship. Can't just come and randomly choose one, one, one opinion over the other. So now that you've done tarjih, you've strengthened one opinion over the other opinion. What's your delil for that? Some scholars of Jadal, they don't believe this is a correct question. Others say that this is question is a question that is sahih, it's correct. And he is right, it's rightfully his right to ask that question. Is it permissible for him to restrict him on the evidence? We know that he can ask him for the evidence, but is it permissible for him to restrict him on the evidence and say, Ma dalilu min al Qurani? Was the evidence from the Quran in this Is it permissible? 
The scholars of Jada, they say, لا يصح للسائل أن يطالب المسؤول لتعيين نوع الدليل. It's not permissible for him to restrict him to a particular delil. It's incorrect. You can't tell me to bring it from the Quran only. Nor can you force me to get it from Bukhari and Muslim alone. You can't. And when evidence should be enough for me? You can't restrict me on the amount of evidence that I have to bring as well. So you can't restrict me on no'iyyat al-dalil, the type of evidence that I bring. You can't restrict me on adad al-dalil, the adad and the amount of the evidences that I have to bring forward. You can't. One evidence is enough for me to bring. Are you with me? He can't. <coughs> so if you're debating with a Hanafi and your evidence is mafhumul mukhalafa, for instance, and you use it to establish a proof against him, so he brings his evidence, and then what you do is you, you demolish his evidence with a mafhumul mukhalafa, he can look at you as a Hanafi and say mafhumul mukhalafa. As a Hanaf, the Hanafis, it has no hujjah for us. You've not brought anything to me personally. You can believe it if you wish to. I can't restrict you to what evidence you can take. Does it make sense? And you can't force me on the evidence of taking mafumul mukhalafa as a hujjah. Does that make sense? Are you with me, brothers? In other words, that's not an evidence. According to the ulama jadal, this is not an evidence for, that you brought so far to him. For him, you haven't brought him an evidence yet. Especially if he's a what? He's a mu'allim. He brought you an evidence straight up from the Quran or the Sunnah. He brought you an evidence. And then you want to oppose his evidence. You want to do mu'aradah of his evidence with a mafhumul mukhalafa. For him, you have not brought any mu'aradah yet. The third question that then you ask is, so you ask him about his madhab, he's told you what view he's taken, then you ask him about his evidence, then he's told you where his evidence he's got, he got it from, and which opinion he strengthened, and why he strengthened the opinion. Now you ask him, and how do you get the evidence from the delil you brought? It's called wajhu dalala. The third question that you ask him is, and wajhu dalala. You ask him, you brought to me an evidence, how have you extracted from this evidence yeah. How have you extracted it from this evidence that the zakatul huli it's obligatory, it's obligatory that you have to pay zakat from it? Are you with me, brothers? And he said to you, my evidence before, as I told you, was what? قوله تعالى والذين يكنزون الذهب والفضة ولا ينفقونها في سبيل الله فبشرهم بعذاب أليم. That was his evidence, Surah Tawbah, Ayah 34. This is what he brought forward. So you now say to him, What's your, how have you extracted that ayah to pay the zakat, zakatul huli? Where did you get it from this ayah? And he says to you, Allah says, it, in the verse, وَالَّذِينَ يَكْنِزُونَ Kunuz in the Arabic language means, when you what? When you keep something, you treasure it. I mean, it's not used. Then Allah says, وَلَا يُنْفِقُونَهَا Then that person does not give from it. فِي سَبِيلِ اللَّهِ إِنَّ الْقُوزُ بَاللَّهِ فَبَشِّرْهُمْ Give him a glad tidings. بِعَذَابٍ أَلِيمٍ A severe punishment. So this here is my evidence. And the word to dalala is as I told you. Are you there? My word to dalala is... That's my word to dalala. Very good. Then you ask him the fourth question, which is Sihatu Dalil. You've asked him about how he extracted the ruling from it. Then you ask him the authentication and the authenticity of the evidence. Is it even authentic what you've just brought forward to me? You ask him about whether this delil is authentic. Is it sahih? 
Is it authentically transmitted? If when he brings it to you and he tells you it, if it's an ayah from the Quran, then la shakka wa la rayb, and it's from the qiraat which is considered, and it's not a qiraat which is shad, even the qiraat is shad, can a hukum fiqh be taken from it? The answer is yes, you can take a hukum fiqh from it. Some of the ulama they say the qiraat which is shad is even stronger than a hadith which is a hadith which is mutawatir. Some scholars said it. Even though it's a qira'ah which is shad, some scholars said no, it's equal to a khabar which is ahad. But the scholars they take ahkam fiqhiyya, rulings of fiqh, from qira'ah which is shad, right? They do. <coughs> and it's definitely stronger than the opinion of a scholar, by the way. So for me to be in your qira'ah which is shad is stronger than the qawl of Imam Ahmad or Shafi'i or others. If what they're saying is just mere statement. The fifth is وَجْهُ الْقَدْحِ فِي الدَّلِيلِ The way to critique and demolish the evidence that they brought forward. So you say to the person that the dalil that you brought forward to strengthen your opinion it's an evidence which you're not permitted to use it's incorrect and then you bring your arguments why you think that's incorrect so what we realize is that the asila the questions it goes back to إِلَى مَنْعٍ Rejection or مُعَارَضَة or opposition or نَقْلٍ or transmission Are you with me brothers? And this inshaAllah ta'ala which is وَجْهُ الْقَدْحِ فِي الدَّلِيلِ We'll be speaking about it in details inshaAllah ta'ala Maybe if today we've got time we will And if we don't If we don't then inshallah ta'ala we will mention it in the Adab al bahth wal munadara written by Tash Kubri Zada rahimahullah. But what, do you, what is it? That the as'ila. Now, once that you've brought all your points forward, the way I have to deal with it is mana. Mana is that I, I don't accept it. And I claim, I now then claim, adamu sihati dalil, dalil, dalalati dalil. I say, no, what you've used, the dalala and the dalil are not together. So the evidence that you're using and how you're extracting the ruling are not related. Are you, are you with me? But the scholars of Jadal, they say, mana, which is to reject, cannot be just merely done. It can only be done when the person who you're arguing with doesn't bring an evidence. You're, then your mana can stand. You can reject. So I don't accept that. Because it's your, your speech is not more valuable than my one, right? Are you with me, brothers? But if the person, he brought all evidence forward, mana is not enough. Mana is just when he's upon da'awah, just claim, when he's just claiming something. Are you with me? Mu'arada, on the other hand, are you with me, brothers? Is what you need to come with when he brings an evidence. Mu'arada, on the other hand, it's basically opposition, dalil with another dalil. Muqabala to dalilin, bi dalilin. So I can't do manna if he brings evidence. What I can do is what? It's called muqabala. I can oppose him and bring evidence like that. Are you with me, brothers? There are conditions in the shurut al-sihat al-su'al. A question will not be accepted, brothers, unless there are some conditions that are intact. You ask this question, are you with me brothers? If these things are not there, then your question, your point coming with this, this, uh, this, this question is not valid. The first one is, You have to have good intention behind why you're doing it. If I feel like you've got a hidden motive, then I have the right to walk away from the discussion at hand. 
Are you there? If I know that the person is coming from the angle of a ta'annuti wal inad, stubbornness and hard headedness, then I don't accept this discussion to carry on between me and you. If the person is asking the question, if the person is asking the question, ala jihati tala'ubi wal abathi, he's playing and he's mocking and he's joking, and he's, then I have the rights to just say, I don't consider your question to be valid, and I'm not going to entertain the idea of your question. The second condition is السؤال, that your question is an amri yakunu khafa'uhu amil umuru al wadihat al jaliyati fa inna sual anha tadhi'u lil waqti. That your question has to be based on a matter which can be hidden. You may not see it. In other words, you're asking me, and we're discussing about something that is hidden, that not every eye can see. You shouldn't ask me about something that's out there in the open that everybody knows. I won't make that into a discussion. As the poet said, It is not befitting for the mind if I would have to bring evidence for the day. That's something you asking me, is it day? I shouldn't entertain that idea. And I shouldn't speak about that. That's the minul umur al daruriya. It's matters that are known out of necessity. The person says to you, Does this universe exist? Huh? If a person says to you, Is Adam alayhi salatu salam the father of the, us? Or he asks you, Is there a place called China in the world? And he wants to have a dialogue regarding that. Or is there Mecca in the, in the world? That's something you don't entertain. And a dialogue shouldn't happen in a matter which is what? Min al umur al wadihat al jaliya. Because that falls under tadiyyu al waqt, it's wasting time. There's no benefit in it and shouldn't be spoken about, anyways. The third condition is the form in which the question is presented. It has to be clear in its form. So I as an individual who is listening to you, the objection that you're bringing forward, which is now you're objecting against me, the question that you want to put against me, I've put my, I've put my foundation in place, I've, I've, I've put my claim. You now want to reject. So what you need to do is you need to bring your point across very, crisp, very clear. So I know the intent behind it. So then when I respond to you, I'm able to respond to something which I have understood. Somebody will come up to you and he'll say to you, listen, he'll deceive you. This is deception in the way they ask you. They'll say to you, Halil Hajju, can Hajj become corrupted? In doing things that are prohibited according to your madhab. You'll say to him, that's deception what you're doing here right now. They're trying to deceive the people. Are you with me, brothers? Don't let that question flow, fall through to you. Somebody will ask you and say to you, according to you, according, according to you, if a person comes with a prohibited act in Hajj, will that corrupt his Hajj? You shouldn't say yes or no to that. Rather, you should say to him, that's deception. The reason is because there are prohibited things in Hajj that corrupt by consent. Kal jima' for instance, sexual intercourse. And there are also things that are done in Hajj that are prohibited from the Mahdurat, but they don't. Like if a person wears cotton, for instance, or if a person places something over their head, or if the person cuts their nails, and the likes of this, no, they don't break your, break your Hajj. Does that make sense? But he asked me a question in a way where it wasn't clear what he meant by it. So you don't entertain that. You have to break it and narrow it down to what he exactly means. If you answer that question with a yes sir, and you are only thinking about jima'ah, you've deceived everybody else. And then that debate goes against you through, whole, through the whole of the... So you have to do tafsil for fi mawtin al-ijmal. When a person comes with a very generic and a very general point, 
and it's not just, you can't ask like that. You need to say, are you with me? That there are some things that do so and there are things that don't. You need to do tafsil. Are you with me, brothers? Number four. <clears throat> the fourth one is that the question, the thing that the person is asking you about, it's possible for you to come to know about it. It's something that knowledge can be brought up regarding it. It has to be from those things. But if somebody asks you about a thing that no one can come to know its knowledge, then it's not permissible to answer. For example, the things that which we will say, Allah is unique in its knowledge. No one else knows except Him. For example, somebody will say to you, Antum You guys claim that Allah has two hands. Okay? How are His two hands? We say to him, that is a question that is null and void. Are you there? So you can turn the table at that person and you say to him, do you affirm that there are stars in the sky? And I'll say to you, yes. So how many stars are in the sky? So how many stars are in there? We'll say, I don't know. Well, I don't know as well. Are you with me? So not just because everything you affirm, that doesn't mean you necessarily know the how to it. Are you with me? So no one can say to you, come adadu nujum is sama. That's a su'al which is fasted. It's corrupt. That's not a question. Are you with me? Or somebody says to you, you affirm rain, right? How many rain drops drop in the UK? Huh? Are you there? No one asks you. Somebody says to you, you believe you've got hair, right? Yeah, how many hairs do you have? Sah? All of these are called su'al, which is fasid. You don't entertain those kind of questions, and they're not a question. Those kind of questions are not correct. So to say, how is Allah's hand is also the same. Are you with me, brothers? The fifth, which is, This person who's been asked this question has to be specific, has to be has to specialize in this particular field. It has to be something he knows. It can't be something he has no knowledge of. Are you there? For example, that person, you can't come to a faqih, a, a jurist, and ask him about matters pertaining to tibb, yeah? medicine and doctors. Huh? You don't. That's not his job. You don't ask him. This question is directed at another type of people. You can't go and ask an engineer about any scientific things, right? You can't ask him of it. Number six, which is the final. There has to be a benefit for the question, not in this question. So if there's no benefit in this question for him, then I shouldn't respond to your question. So the Masail which scholars call, there's no benefit under talking about it. Are you with me? Then people shouldn't ask those type of questions, it shouldn't be in a dialogue. Like for example, if we find out that the people of Kaf, they had a dog with them, right? So finding out what type of dog they had with them. Was it a German Shepherd or was it Chihuahua? Uh, was it, uh, we don't need to know what type of dog it is. W are you going to take benefits from it? Are you going to take a benefit from it? Yeah? Is it going to increase your Iman? It's nothing, no benefits. I don't need to know that. Sah? So people sometimes want to find out about things that if knowledge regarding it increases, there's no benefits in it for them. So you ask about a matter which there's a benefit in it for you. So if you ask me about something there's no benefit in it, it's of no value. Lidalik ibn al-Qayyim rahimahullah, he mentioned that some of the times what happens to the students of knowledge is that 
they busy themselves with transmitting speeches and views of scholars. He brings aqwal al ulama. Fulan said this, Alan said this, and this came, Fulan came, and Fulan said this as well. And so he brings you all the views of this issue. Aqwal. Fulan said this, Fulan said this, Alan said this, said so, so, said this. When he brings you all the aqwal, if you ask him, okay, which one's the strongest? And what's the evidence of every party? He doesn't know anything regarding it. And Ibn Al-Qayyim mentions that this, the aspiration of a student of knowledge, it should be what? Himam al-Tullab al it should be what? To know what Allah intends and that which the messenger intended by what he said. Your aspiration should be what did Allah mean and what did the messenger والسلام, mean in this particular issue. Are you with me brothers? But for wanting to know the speeches of the scholars, how much views there are in this particular matter, and then you can't even strengthen between the opinions, this without a shadow of a doubt is what? This, without a shadow of a doubt, is uh, falls under the su'al uh, questions. What benefit did you gain now? Jam'u al-aqwal. What did you benefit from it? Nothing. Okay? Now, if you memorize all the views that are there, and you memorize each view that they brought forward, and then you learn what, why were they using that evidence, and what was their reason behind it, and then you learn <coughs> how to strengthen one opinion over the other, that's true need. You came out with a thamara. You came out with some fruits and benefits, right? But anything that doesn't have no thamara behind it, no fruit that come out of it, you're just wasting your time. And your brothers, time is of high value for you as a student of knowledge. You ain't gonna get this opportunity again. So right now you need to just busy yourself with what? That's why the poet said, فَمَا حَوَ الْغَيَاتُ فِي أَلْفِ السَّنَةِ شَخْصٌ فَخُذْ مِنْ كُلِّ فَنٍ أَحْسَنَةِ بحفظ متن جامع للراجح تأخذه على مفيد الناصح. No one's gonna live for a thousand years. None of us. And even those who did couldn't be able to grasp all of knowledge. You'll still die and there's more, not, there's more that you haven't learned yet. So you don't go off track when it comes to seeking knowledge. You take what's fundamental first. And after time, your life still carries on and you've taken a great portion of the fundamentals, then you move on to the those which are in second, and then those that come third. But if your time is, your life is so short, you're jumping from, from, from the, you're not, you're not, you, know, you don't know things which are usul. Yeah. You don't know shurutu la ilaha illallah, you're talking about hilf al-fudul, mathalan. Shurutu la ilaha is more important for you. I know what la ilaha illallah means and its means. And what nullifies la ilaha illallah over, what does hilf al-fudul mean? Hilf al-fudul is not fardu ayn for everyone to know. Fardu kifani. Does that make sense? And knowing other things like that. Such as an example. So this shows that this person doesn't know the old al ilm, the order and the sequence in which knowledge should be in. Okay? Um, today we'll conclude here bi al kareem. We'll stop here. And uh, the rest we'll just leave it for the book, inshallah, ta'ala tomorrow. Um, the book is short anyways, we'll finish it sometime, so maybe 9.30 tomorrow as well. That's how short the kitab is. It won't take more than two hours, two to three hours. So we'll finish it tomorrow, inshallah, ta'ala. A lot of the points we already understood. We just now need to organize the book and how it's going to be. And I have a very long day today, so inshallah, ta'ala, I will... The longest day, so I'm going to have to go running around in many places. Um, anything which I've said that was wrong or incorrect is from me, Shaytan and Allah and His Messenger are free from it. Subhanakallah, Muhammadik, Ashadu Allah, Ilaha illallah, Astaghfiruka, Tuwilay.